right, so welcome to the last of our free webinars for the year. It's an amazing, um, it, well, isn't it amazing just how quickly time has flown since I started doing these webinars after we uh, had all those lockdowns. What was that, March? I think that would have been. So I've lost track of the number of times I've sat in front of this camera with this background there and spoken to you all. So. Uh, Anyway, welcome to the last one. And, and, and today, um, a little bit different. Um, this is much more casual. Uh, I don't have a particular deep concept to share with you. I just want to show you some hopefully pleasant images and uh, from Australia, of course, that's why it's called Destination Australia. And also um, share with you the stories about how those pictures came to be and how I took them. So what I'd really encourage you to do is, is to ask questions. Um, I fumbled around this morning. Um, I, I set this talk up a little bit late, I have to confess. And when I realized that I'd um, gone for this Australian theme, I realized just how many pictures I have of Australia, 130,000 or something. So I decided to break it down just into, into three sections. I'm just going to cover rainforests, uh, coast and outback, just broadly. Um, if you want more detail on the best places to photograph in Australia, and there's plenty of them, shameless plug, I actually wrote a book about it um, quite a few years ago now. This is the third edition of Australia, the Photographer's Eye, and there are about 30 chapters in here going through specific places with all of the information about how to photograph them, GPS references for all the pictures and all that sort of stuff. So it's in all good bookstores, as they say. All right, so please um, do feel free to answer questions. And the first one I've already had from anonymous attendee who um, last time was Russell Shakespeare, but it could be anyone tonight. Uh, when will I be able to access the recording? Absolutely, you will. So if you have to duck out, this recording, as all of our webinars uh, have, have been, will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, in the next day or so. Um, and if you haven't seen our YouTube channel, I strongly recommend you go and have a look because there was a, a lot of stuff that we've recorded over the last nine months, um, interviews with people, techniques, um, a few bits of product information, uh, the Q2 monochrome launch from last week is on there already um, with Knox Bertie, which was a terrific conversation. We both really enjoyed that last week. And I know it's quite a few of the people who are on my attendee list here were there as well. So that was great. Um, so uh, yeah, that was um, just wanted to make that point about the book. And please do feel free to ask questions. I've got a bit of gear here in case anybody asks me about gear. All right, let's press on. Um, I'm just going to get to my first slide and then I'm going to share that with you. Rainforests. Okay, so it'll be a bit of a ramble tonight. Um, I'm just going to, like I said, discuss these pictures and talk a little bit about the sorts of pictures that I've been shooting for quite a long time now. Um, I've been photographing Australia since 1990 in detail and a little bit before that. So that's 30 years within this country. Um, I used to shoot a lot more landscapes. Now I tend to shoot a lot more documentary people stuff. That's kind of a natural evolution. Now, landscapes are relatively easy to shoot when you know how, like so many things, um, because they don't argue back, they don't move, they don't go, you know, you're not hard to find. There's the landscape. It's all about the light that nature gives you and the way you compose the image and how you construct it. Um, it's a more methodical process. Uh, you can slow down, be in the moment and so on, as opposed to the frenetic, frenetic pace of photographing rodeos or festivals or whatever it is you do with people. It's a totally different ball game. So I spent a lot of time doing this sort of work. And uh, over the years, I've distilled it down into some fairly basic approaches to getting the sorts of shots that you'll see this evening. Um, now, uh, first question from Sean Zhang. Zhang, never can get that right. Um, I'm planning to go somewhere outside Sydney for a vacation with my friends next month. I'd like to know some available locations with some good fun spots and interesting photography spots. Hey, Blue Mountains, absolutely superb for, there's a lot of variety there. The Valley of the Waters or the Grand Canyon Walk. If you want to spend two or three hours with your camera and your tripod, have a really great time there. Uh, you'll real, absolutely not regret it. It's a fantastic place. Um, it's in my book as well, a whole, whole, <laughs> a whole chapter on Blue Mountains. Okay, um, 
Rainforest. Let's start with the rainforest. Excuse me a sec. What's... Pardon? Oh, they were what right now? No, no. Uh, they were fire. Mountains. Yeah, there were of course fires in the Blue Mountains last summer. So who knows what those places will be like? Sorry, I forgot about that. But absolutely worth checking out. Uh, just about anywhere up there, and even over in a bit further in Lithgow. So you'll enjoy that. Okay, light, um, rainforests. Uh, the thing about rainforests is that they are quite difficult to photograph in a pleasing manner. There's two very good reasons for that. And when I explain them, you'll go, okay, that's why if you've ever photographed in rainforests, you may not have been uh, as happy as you would like to have been with the results. First thing is, it's almost impossible to photograph a rainforest when it's not cloudy. Um, the ideal conditions are bright, overcast, particularly after rain or during rain or with mist or with low cloud or anything other than blue sky. Uh, even if the sun's low on the horizon and you've got blue sky, you get this horrible blue light when there's just no color in everything. And if the sun's high above you in the middle of the day, the contrast is just so ludicrously high that the camera cannot cope with it. You can try any technique you like. It's just not going to happen. You're better off not bothering. However, when the uh, conditions are good, you get this lovely soft light. And this is Dorigo National Park. This is Crystal Cascade, I think, in Dorigo. You could actually walk behind that waterfall. If I, if you can see my mouse, you actually walk behind the waterfall there, which is really cool. Um, and it was on a bright overcast day. So you can see how the, the bright reflections on the leaves are no longer there. So if you had sun shining on the leaves there, the, those glossy leaves reflect back so much light that there's no green left behind. So you just see this almost monochrome, harsh result. But as soon as you've got a big, bright light source above your head, clouds, you get this much softer result. There's another thing that I should point out that you should consider doing is using a polarizing filter. Uh, it sounds a bit weird. I mean, most people think of polarizing filters as being something you'll use to make the sky go more contrasty, make the bright, you know, white puffy clouds stand out more. Sure, you can do that. Um, or for removing reflections off water or making the sea look more intensely blue. And absolutely, you can do that. But polarizers remove reflections. Think about a rainforest leaf. The reflection of bright light on the green swamps the green. It's, it's white. So the highlights on the leaves are white, not green. If you remove the reflections by using a polarizing filter, more green comes through. And it's an absolutely standard approach. And this shot would have been taken with a polarizing filter, long exposure, and obviously using a tripod. The long exposure makes the waterfall make that lovely, smooth plume of water. Uh, and in fact, it's very hard not to get that because there's usually relatively low light in, in uh, rainforests. So a tripod is almost an absolute must. Next one. This is Tasmania. Now, I, there may be somebody joining us this evening who might have been there on the workshop that I did uh, Was it earlier last year. We uh, went up to Horseshoe Falls. And this takes me to my second point about why rainforests are a little bit tricky to photograph. It's very, very hard to pick out a point of view, a thing to, that your eye can start with. A, a rainforest is usually just a mash or mishmash of green shapes, maybe vertical lines for the trees, but it's just chaos. A good photograph will often have some particular thing which you, the photographer, are saying, look at that. It's like something that's everything else sits around, a point of view, a point of focus. And they're quite hard to find in rainforests. They're usually waterfalls or streams, or in this particular case, waterfalls and tree ferns, which make really nice shapes. So if you can isolate something interesting, then you've got a chance of making a reasonably pleasing image. And you may find that you have to move around a little bit and configure your image in a more pleasing way. This is one angle. Um, one of the things about this particular spot in Tasmania, it's Mount Field National Park, is that there is a walking uh, trail and then a boardwalk. So you're actually not allowed to leave the boardwalk. So your choices of composition are very limited. Th this was one that I enjoyed because the waterfall is taking second, is playing second, second fiddle to the tree fern. But also you could get another angle like this where the tree fern and the waterfall 
are now uh, balanced and they are clearly the subject of the shot. And that light and subject are the two difficult things to overcome when it comes to rainforest photography. And next time you go out, if you didn't know that already, I think that approach will make a big difference to your, your photography. Okay, uh, follow-up from Sean. Yes, I've been to Blue Mountains, wonderful place. What I was hoping is to explore further, a bit further afield. Oh, <laughs> like Perth, Cairns, Darwin or Tasmania. I got the impression you were looking at the outskirts of Sydney. Okay, well, all of the above. <laughs> um, of the three, four, I'd probably look at Tasmania. Um, Darwin's a long way from anywhere. Cairns is good. Um, if you can get up to Daintree, I'm not sure if I've got a picture of the Daintree rainforest here. It's possibly not. We'll have a look in a sec. And um, there's some really good um, material around there. Cape Tribulation's nice to get out in the Barrier Reef is good. Uh, that's usually better from the air than from the water. Um, Perth, Perth itself is like any city. It's a city that you're photographing. But if you were going to Perth and you've got a car, I'd go three hours south to the southwest corner and there's an enormous variety of fabulous photography around there. Um, check out Christian Fletcher's website. Uh, his gallery is down in Dunsborough down there and you'll see all of the amazing places in that area. So that would be a, a fabulous place, but you've got to fly to Perth and then drive three hours. Um, I've got some pictures of the Kimberley coming up as well, uh, which is even further away. That's probably 24 hours drive north. That's a fair way. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of places there. Tony V. Hi, Nick. I was in the Melbourne Leica store last week and spent time viewing your stunning images in the gallery that they have up. What inspires you or has inspired you in the past to create your art? Um, it's not, is it art? Is that a question for another time with a glass of red wine? <laughs> um, I think I, I'm a little bit of a pragmatist. I'm a professional photographer. I don't necessarily consider my work in an artistic sense. It's more functional, uh, descriptive, depictive. It's for a particular purpose. Um, it's not created in it for in and of its own sort of on, on its own merits, if that makes sense. Um, so it's a little bit hard to answer that question. Um, my inspiration comes from having had an idea and then going and executing that idea. And where the original idea comes from, well, who knows? That's that's a tricky one. This particular exhibition you're talking about is my Heart of Australia exhibition, which I did a webinar about um, earlier in the year. If you want to check it out on the YouTube channel, you'll see all the pictures that Tony is talking about there. That's all people, all people, completely people. Jeff Rosen, what speed and f-stop are you using here? I'm presuming, uh, I've just got to coordinate the pictures, so I'm presuming you're talking about the rainforest one of the um, uh, Mountfield National Park. I really use um, a middle of the range aperture, so 5.6 to 11, something like that. And the shutter speed is whatever it needs to be to get a decent exposure. Um, it's The shutter speed is almost irrelevant, except for how it shows the waterfall, in which case anything slower than about a quarter of a second, half second, one second, will give you much the same result. So it, a lot of it comes down to just whatever exposure you need to get the right, to get a correct exposure. Um, so yeah, I, I shoot most of my stuff at sort of F8 for these sorts of things. I very rarely shoot at F16 because the picture softens off a little bit. Um, Ian, are these single photographs or have you merged two to three? Ooh, yes, good question. Um, I, somebody was paying attention last week. <laughs> Let me just go back a, a photo and I will tell you, oops, that's forwards, my bad. There we go, that one and that one. These are multiple exposures. That's the other thing I often do. This particular shot here was taken right on the edge of acceptable lighting conditions. And by that, I mean the sun was coming, going behind clouds and then appearing. And if you look carefully up in this area here, and if you saw the original, this area here was quite sunlit, but this area here was in nice soft light. So I had to work a little bit harder than I would like to have done to get this picture into a pleasing tonal range. But I'm hoping that nobody else seeing this picture would have ever noticed that I might have doing that. The reason, Ian, the reason Ian picked this up is probably because he attended the workshop that I did last week on precisely that auto bracketing technique, which is all about handling contrast. It can't get you out of trouble when it's full sunlight, 
but it can get you out of trouble when it's just on the edge there. So well picked up there, Ian. <laughs> um, David Foles suggests Mosman Gorge is a beautiful place. Yes, near Cairns, absolutely. I've been there repeatedly. Um, i tell you one thing about Mosman Gorge, though. Try and go but be the first one there. It's got really busy in the last couple of years. They get as many people as Uluru, can you believe? Um, and, and if anyone's been to Mosman Gorge and the river there, there's only two or three places you can really get to the river. So it gets really busy. So it's one of those places where timing is everything. If you get there in the middle of the day, you'll have 500 people sharing the place with you, which they're just as entitled to be there as you are. But if you want to get a good photograph, it's kind of nice to have that photograph without too many people in it. Mark Medosh. Hi, Mark. Um, if it's too bright during a long exposure with a polarizer, would you stack the polarizer with an ND filter? Um, when you say too bright, um, there's no such thing as too bright or too dark. What there is, is a combination of shutter speed and aperture and ISO, which doesn't give you the result you want. So regardless of how much light there is, a correct exposure will always be a correct exposure. The difference is when you want to use a different aperture or shutter speed for a different effect. And in the case of bright light, very frequently the shutter speed is too high to get some sense of movement. In which case, yes, absolutely, I would use an ND filter. And I actually have one right here. I knew somebody would ask me about this. Um, I only use one ND filter. Um, this is a 10 stop neutral density filter. And the reason, I don't know, you probably can just see a black disc. There is nothing, I can't see through that. It's almost like, it's like a welder's mask and it reduces the exposure by 10 stops. That pushes a bright day exposure when you might be using a 250 to 500 of a second, right the way down to multiple seconds. And I've got some pictures later where I talk about, I'll talk about using that filter because it's one of my standard little tools. Okay, moving along, that's the questions finished at the moment. So then this is a place I've just been to. I just had a few days away. And, and I know that those of you in Victoria are now loud out. So whoopee, you can come and in, be inspired by these pictures, hopefully, and get out there and take some great photographs. This is near Coffs Harbour. This is a place called Never Never Creek, and it's on Promised Land Road in a place called Glen Glenifer near Bellingen. And it's a beautiful spot when it's, because again, it's getting a bit busy. Uh, it's not a secret spot anymore. Um, probably people like me who publish photographs of it are responsible for that. But if you can get yourself there on a nice quiet day when you've got a nice overcast, um, uh, ice overcast weather, you can get some lovely, lovely rock effects. And the reason I put this one in is because whilst I think this picture is entirely acceptable, it shows the place in, in good light. Um, it's, it, it's, it's only just depictive. It just shows the place. There's nothing more than that. Isolating something and, and making a very specific subject out of something can be even better. So whilst I've just done this, this is shot on the Leica S medium format camera. I pretty sure it's a two image stitch. So I've, that's why it's that panoramic shape. I've just done 50 millimeter lens left and then right, probably just two shots overlapping just to give me a bit of width and, and a medium long exposure, maybe one second to make the water just blow a little bit. What I'm looking for is the reflections of bright things in the water. And if you look carefully, that yellow of the water is actually the vegetation higher up reflecting the water. And as long as the water itself is in the shade, not in the sun, doesn't work if it's in the sun, if the water's in the shade, but the reflection of something, there is a reflection of something bright, it carries that color through to the reflection on the water and you can get something like that. And that will only work when that rocks in the shade or close to the shade, but the, the vegetation that's lit up by the sun is reflected in that water. If the sun was on this rock, you wouldn't see that reflection as, as much. It would be overpowered. Um, it's something that you can see when you're walking along a river and it's sunny. If you look in the shady areas, sometimes you can find interesting angles where you've got reflections of bright, usually green or yellow or in red sometimes in the, um, in the outback, um, uh, something bright reflecting that water. It's a very powerful tool to make the image look a lot more 
interesting. Uh, questions coming through thick and fast here. Um, let me see which one first. Uh, anonymous attendee, maybe the same one, it may not be, no way of telling. <laughs> I am in a state of confusion. I have been shooting the old rules of F8 at a 250th ISO at 100, fair enough, in bright sunshine. However, I have recently attended a workshop in which the motto is to shoot wide open. Yep. So I've been shooting at F0.95. Good for you. Obviously have a Noctilux. But I find my shots are too soft and not sharp. It's kind of the whole point. Love the dreamy look, but find it difficult to accept that the focus is not always spot on. Do you shoot landscapes wide open? That's a really interesting question. And the answer is no. Um, I, I very, very frequently shoot people wide open because I'm trying to isolate them from the background. But when I'm photographing landscapes, it's a very rare photograph where you're isolating something for the background, unless it's something small like a detail, like a little plant or a little, like those tree ferns, you know, how they unfurl at that little curly end. Isolating that against a background makes it stand out. But if you mean a landscape in terms of a vista, like, let me just go back one notch. Oops, that way. A shot like this, a traditional shot, absolutely not, because you want everything to be sharp. And the reason for that is because as you look through your eyes and you experience the world around you, your eyes autofocus continuously and you cannot control it. If you really, really, really try hard, it's possible to focus on your fingertip and then without looking, try and be aware of the background. But that's more to do with your eyes zeroing in like this, like um, aligning on the subject than it is to do with actual depth of field. Um, so your awareness of your surroundings is, a, is an awareness of everything is in focus. So if you try and do a, a landscape picture where the foreground is out of focus, say, then when you look at that image, especially when it's made into a big print, that out of focus foreground just looks like a mistake because your eye wants to focus on it and it can't and it's disturbing. Now, a lot of people have rebelled against this idea of lots of depth of field, sharp landscapes front to back and they've tried to go in different directions, rarely successfully. If you look at the top landscape photographers in the world, buy their books, look at, one, look at them online, you'll rarely find the, the vista type pictures or even the medium vista type pictures like the one on the screen now will be anything other than sharp. They might focus on details like leaves or tree bark or something and have an out of focus background, but a landscape picture of a landscape broadly will always be sharp. So hopefully that answers your question. That's a good question though. Thank you for that, Mr. Anonymous attendee. All right, next picture. So this, this is really, I, I probably could have photographed this at a wide aperture, maybe. Uh, I don't actually know what the aperture would have been with this from probably F8 or 11, because I wanted the rock to be sharp front to back. But now we're starting to get a little bit more detailed maybe you could experiment with limited depth of field. That rock's about six feet, six feet wide, so it's not that small. Okay, next picture. Uh, okay, now here we go. This really leads from your question, I, I, I think. This is when you want to separate a small detail out from a, from a distracting background. This is up in Springbrook National Park, just on the border of New South Wales and Queensland, um, back of the Gold Coast. And I've done plenty of other pictures of the, the wider scenes, which you'll see in a sec. But as we were walking back to the car, I, having done my wider shots, I often then start to look at things in a bit more of a different way. And often that means looking for little details. And I saw these beautiful pin cushions of moss. And what I've done here is I've got very low and I've overlapped two sort of pin cushions of moss. So that and one sharp and one's not, which gives it three dimensions. So this would have been shot on a macro lens, um, in particular the 60 millimeter macro on the Leica CL, the Elmerit TL lens, um, and that would have been at 2.8 at the widest aperture. So with your Noctilux, um, your f 0.95 lens, you could have got an even more out of focus background with this shot. Focusing close is a little tricky on the Nocti. Um, Leica do make a macro adapter for the M lenses, which sits behind the lens. And as you rotate it, there's some helicoids which 
push the lens away from the body and allows it to focus much closer. It's really neat. Peter Carver actually has been having, our lens designer has been having a lot of fun with the Noctilux and the macro adapter photographing very small things with virtually no depth of field. That's uh, his little hobby at the moment. Um, question, here we go. Um, Pauline Roach, uh, in your book, do you talk about f-stop? Oh yeah, there, there's there's oodles. There's It's a photographer's book. It's not just a picture book. There's At the back of the book, um, there's a whole bunch of photo tips, one per chapter, and they all explain all sorts of things about apertures and shutter speeds and so on. Not in the sense of an instructional book about what apertures and shutter speeds are, but how I've used them. Uh, if you want more information about that, uh, I suggest you come on one of our workshop um, webinars and when we talk about those sorts of things. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of photographic technical information in this book. It's not just a coffee table book about Australia. It's for photographers to help them go to these places and get good photographs. Okay, let's move on. Next picture. So this is uh, this particular picture and the next one, these two, are shot on a lens that I've been experimenting a little bit with. Um, it's not a Leica lens. Um, there's a brand called Lauer, L-A-O-W-A, Lauer, and they make lenses in a M mount and they are pretty good. And I was given one, I don't own one, I was given one to try out as an alternative. So this is um, a nine millimeter lens. So it's, a, it's super, super wide. The nearest lens in the Leica range would be the 16 to 35 on the SL2 or the, um, the, the Tri-Elmar on the M, which is 16, 18, 21, so 16 millimeter. But even that doesn't quite get this close. It's, it's not a fisheye lens. It's just very, 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 very wide. And what you can do with it is, is find something and get quite close to it, but it doesn't look like you're really close to it. So this particular tree with its really interesting root structure is only about, I don't know, 18 inches from the camera, but you can gather in the rainforest around it. And I found that it's, it's a little bit like underwater photographer. The idea is to get really, really close and then have everything else disappear into distance. Um, it, it allows you to isolate a subject which of course is the hardest part. And these are Antarctic beech trees near, again, in Springbrook National Park. And you can see the light here. This is um, high up, so it's on top of the hills. And when the clouds are low, which you often get around that neck of the woods, you get this lovely misty effect. And as the trees recede into the mist, they get paler and more indistinct. And it gives a lovely sense of three dimensionality. Uh, I mean, the, you could shoot this shot with any lens, um, you know, 16 mil would be fine, but it wouldn't be quite the same shot. I just wanted that really wide um, look and it, it worked out really well. So it's an interesting effect. Okay, another question coming in here. Two, in fact. Um, oh, Debbie Tallon says that the different times listed between the emails, the ticket times, I do apologize for that. It sure could be time zone difference. Um, anyway, uh, I do apologize for that. Mark. Nick, in your photos and especially nature, not just landscapes, how much do you rely on using a tripod? Uh, what do you have to carry? What do you use to carry your tripod? Mark, you have a thing about tripods, don't you? <laughs> you asked me something about this last time. Okay, um, I have two tripods. Um, the smaller one is not this one. This is my um, three series. I don't know if you can see that in the small image, but it's a Gitzo three series. Um, and that's a little on the heavier side. And I was using that the, the last weekend for doing my very, very long exposures, which I'll talk about in a sec, because you really need a solid base. But the Series 2 tripod, which I also have, is more of my general purpose tripod because it will fit uh, into my suitcase easily and it will strap onto my backpack quite easily too. So it's, uh, it's a compromise. All tripods are compromise. If you, if, you want the app, if you want a picture to be absolutely rock solid, it's going to hurt when you carry it because it's going to have to be heavy. If you lug around or a little pocket sized tripod, it's going to be difficult to use and not that steady unless it's there's no not even a hint of breeze. So you really have to weigh up how much suffering you're prepared to go through to get a steady picture. Um, one of my colleagues in the landscape business, uh, Les Walkling, who's a color management specialist, he carries around a Pentax Theodolite tripod which packs down to about four feet long and weighs about 10 kilos, but my goodness, it's solid. And he 
reckons it's worth it, but um, reckon he's crazy, but <laughs> no, he's right. He's right, but he has to suffer to get that solid platform. So, um, and I don't use it all the time, Mark, but there are certain sorts of pictures where it's absolutely necessary. This picture on the screen right now, 100% necessary. If you shot this handheld, you would have been forced to use 1600 ISO, 3200 ISO. So by not using a tripod, you're compromising your image quality. You'd get a picture, but it would be a picture that wouldn't be nowhere near as good as it could have been had you taken the tripod with you. So I, 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 I can't advise people whether they should or shouldn't use a tripod. I do know that if you spend a lot of money on a Leica camera and a lot of money on a Leica lens, you really should let it do its thing and be as give you as good a result as possible. And a tripod in many cases will allow you to do that. Not all, but many. Okay. Uh, now, did talk before about um, a point of interest. And I put this picture in to show that if you are walking with somebody else and you find a nice path sort of graphic, let them walk ahead, stand, look up, hold still for a quarter of a second, take the picture with them in the bottom image. And it gives that, that rain for us a different scale. Because without, if you hold your finger over, that's my wife actually, if, if you hold my, your finger over the, her in the picture, you'll see there's no scale. The, the picture could be twice as big or twice as small. But as soon as there's a human figure in that, you know exactly how big things are. And it's a really nice little extra to, to add to your series of pictures that you shoot. Um, so highly recommended. And it gives the eye something to start on in the picture. It gives it that point of view, which is really important. Another question coming up here. Sean, again, speaking of lenses, have you heard of the brand Seven Artisans? I have heard of them. Uh, they have M lenses like the ones made from Leica with much cheaper price. I've just purchased one recently. Well, let me know how you go. Um, from what I hear is they are, they you get what you expect from them. They have quite a high um, specification, like fast and, and well priced, but you will always, there will always be a compromise there. And from what I gather, the look is really good, but they are just not as sharp. But when you look at the price point, you go, that's pretty compelling. I've not used one myself, but I do know that that lower lens was I would have to say sharper than I expected, um, which is, and I have pretty high expectations. So that's something to check out, but it would be interesting to see. So yeah, the, the seven artisans do make some quite exotic lenses and uh, it might be worth checking out. Anonymous attendee again, do you apply vignetting in post-processing for these landscape shots? Yeah, I do a lot. I really want to force, no, not force. I'd like to encourage my viewer's eye to stay within the frame and bright edges, if you've got a darker core of a picture and lighter edges, it just looks weird because your eye sort of skates all over the place. But if you can reverse that and have a, light, a lighter core center and slightly darker edges, it's amazing how, how much more compelling that picture looks. You look at any of the old masters painters and you'll see they do the same thing. They want to control where your eye goes. And that subtle vignette is always is one really good way of doing it. This picture will be vignetted that you can see on the screen right now. Um, if I was able to flip with it on and off, you'd see quite a difference. I'm hoping you don't notice because an overdone vignette is no good. But one that's done just subtly makes a huge difference to a picture. Okay, lots of questions tonight. This is great. Uh, now, this is that nine millimeter lower lens again, and it allows you to get a perspective and the same with a 16 mil to a lesser extent. It allows you to get down and close and work with some powerful dynamic lines. I mean, the lines of that water pulling your eye into the shot from the left takes you down the river. And then there's those um, plants which are very distinctive, give your eye something to, to see rather than just a mishmash of green. So extracting subjects is really important and again a quarter of a second half a second exposure keeps that water flowing nicely this is one of the waterfalls on that same walk in springbrook actually and one of the things i do like doing is the really really long exposures of waterfalls where the water falling almost disappears but the water that trickles down the rock when it hits the rock stays white and is more distinct luckily this is the base of this waterfall 
to not Twin Falls, can't remember the name of it. It's on one of the Springbrook walking track circuits um, is black basalt. So it really stands out well. And I've kept it blue. So to give it that cool look, um, the white balance in these sorts of pictures is very, it's a very slippery concept. If I neutralize this, it would probably just look muddy, but I've actually I've not exaggerated the blue, but I've kept it on daylight white balance, even though the light falling on that waterfall is only blue sky or bright clouds and is very blue in its very nature. So you will end up with a bluer picture. And I like that in this picture. So I've not tried to correct it. Uh, I think it adds to the atmosphere. Tony V, when shooting with a digital camera, do you like to shoot with a three by three grid switched on? I do actually, uh, Tony, I do leave it turned on. On the SL2, you have the option to choose four different viewfinder layouts um, with and without grids, with and without histograms, whatever you want, and four different configurations, which you can cycle through with a button. And one of those is with the three by three grid. Not so much for composition, if that's what you're getting at, but I, for some reason, after a long time photographing, seem to have difficulty shooting my pictures level. I very frequently have to correct my level in post. Um, even if it's just a tiny bit, it really bugs me when it's not level. So if I've shot it slightly wonky, so I often do have the level on, but also with the grid, it gives me a reference line to work off as well. I find the green leveling thing a little bit distracting, but the grid gives me a line to work off. So I do shoot with it on, yeah, quite a bit actually. Good question. Um, okay, question. Da, 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 da. What's oh, the waterfall exposure duration of this waterfall, David Bignall? Um, that would have been around about two seconds, I think. Um, interestingly enough, at the bottom of big waterfalls, it gets quite windy and there's quite a lot of buffeting, even though it's not a particularly huge waterfall. You do get a lot of breeze wafting off it, which takes not only moisture off the waterfall. So I had to keep cleaning the filter frequently from the spray, but also if your tripod is not reasonably sturdy, two second exposures are quite hard to do and get a sharp image. So I was using my series two tripod, but if you are using a tripod that's a little bit less sturdy than you might like, sit down on the ground and don't extend the legs. It's not as comfortable to work, but by not extending the legs so the tripod's only this tall, you'll have a much, much more stable shot because there's no flex possible in those legs. Sort of little tip there, I suppose, if you've got some wind and you want to be steady, you want to do a long exposure, yeah, just don't extend the legs. All right, that's it for rainforests. Let's talk about coastal pictures. And I'm just checking to see how we're doing for time because I've spoken longer about those pictures than I had expected to. <laughs> so let's go on to some coastal pictures. And, oops, come on. There, oops, there we go, that one. I just wanna, I put this picture in. You, you, a lot of you will probably recognize this particular place. It's one of the iconic images from the Southwest of WA. The reason I put it in is because uh, some places do offer an enormous variety of different looks, even though it's the same single place. So this is shot on a fisheye lens as a multiple exposure or, um, exposure bracket to control the contrast. That's why it's got that slightly weird look in the sky where things are slightly curved. Uh, it doesn't look very fisheye-like though. If you have a fisheye lens where the horizon's in the middle, it won't curve. And there's not many straight lines in nature. So sometimes you can shoot pictures with fisheye lenses that give you an almost correct look, but obviously you're getting 180 degrees. So that's one angle of the, uh, of the sugar loaf rock. Then this is the more formal angle. And I've done this in black and white and a very long exposure using my 10 stop ND filter. This is 24 seconds. I looked it up before when I set up the, this talk so I could tell you exactly what it was. That's on the Leica S. Um, S2 rather, with the 35 mil Summilux lens on it, and so a Summicron lens on it. And that's why the sky is an interesting texture because the clouds have moved just like the water during exposure. It's, some say it's a little bit of an overdone effect. I would say it's overdone because it's really good and I really like it. Uh, it just adds a level of, I don't know, sophistication somehow to it. Call it a cliche. 
and cliches are cliches because for a good reasons because they're actually good <laughs> and lots of people want to do it so anyway and then this is shot on the deluxe of all cameras this was doing a recce and then for no no with no warning at all the light just went whoa fantastic and i had my cameras in the backpack we were just scrambling around the rocks which were quite slippery so i didn't really want to waste time had the deluxe in my pocket and I did um, a little panoramic stitch with the Deluxe and ended up with this picture, which comes up very nice in a print this big. So the camera you have in your hand is the best one at the time. <laughs> Any more questions? There's one more here, two more. Ken Wang, do you, did you set the live view to color or black and white? Oh, um, this is presumably the previous mm. picture, just quickly going back. Um, oh God, I can't go backwards and forwards with these things. There we go. Um, this was shot in color and then converted to black and white in post. Uh, I would have shot it in color in camera and then decided later to do this. Um, yeah, so rather, but I, I could easily have set the camera to black and white mode to get a black and white JPEG, but still a color raw file. And then I could have visualized it. But in this case, it was shot in color. Another question, do you ever let, ever manipulate the scene, remove dead wood, leaves litter before taking pictures? Um, it depends what it is. It's a good question, actually. It's a, it's a searching question. You have to kind of make your own mind up what's acceptable or not. Um, do I dress the scene? If it's something really, re, if it's something really objectionable and that's not likely to be there if I came back, like litter, Coke can, water bottle, then absolutely I'll remove it. Uh, if it's a big dead tree, well, I can't remove it. So that's, you just got to work with it. Um, if I'm doing close up stuff, sometimes I will dress that just by pulling out very carefully, just little things that are distracting, but as little as possible. So everybody walks their own line with that. Um, you know, a 100% found object is very rare where you don't have to do anything. Um, sometimes everything's perfect except for one little something that's right in the middle that's bright and you just think that's ruining the picture and if you can take it away without damaging anything without any consequences then yeah so you have to make your own mind up against that about that one that's a it's a good question um vincent ip would like to know about the technique of stitching pictures together please you should have come to the workshop last week were you with that one vincent i know you've been to plenty of my events your, your name's very familiar um i if i've got time at the end i'll come back to that remind me because I, I want to get on and get through these pictures um okay that's that one and so here's one i shot on uh, on the weekend um this is the sl2 with the 24 to 90 and using my 10 stop nd filter and one of the amazing things about electronic viewfinder cameras, as opposed to DSLRs, so if anybody is listening has got a DSLR, um, it's almost impossible to focus a DSLR when you're using a strong ND filter because you're looking through the lens. It's an optical path. The, the light comes through the lens, it's projected onto the back of a ground glass screen, and you're looking at that. Very hard to focus. You've got to focus first, then put the filter on, and then shoot the picture. With an electronic viewfinder, you don't notice that the filter's on because it corrects for it. So you just look through the camera as normal. Um, unbelievably easy. So a picture like this becomes pretty much effortless. This is 240 seconds. So what's that? Four minutes. That's pretty long. The clouds weren't moving. Uh, they're just right, just static there, but you can see what's happened to the water. And sometimes I do these really long exposures just to see what happens. And I, I, I quite like this one. It's very bleak. Um, it was a very leaden day. There was no color. The water was gray. The sky was gray. So sometimes you've got to go with that and, and celebrate it rather than trying to make it something it's not. So that's something I do quite a bit. Same thing here. It's the, the following uh, evening right at dusk. This is, I think, about 60 seconds. And I know it's an artificial effect, but is it? I mean, your eye will never see this, but it's simply an accumulation of all the movement of the water. How is that different from a video in a way? So the fact that the water's moved during the exposure accumulates all the, the water into one image. The rock hasn't moved, the water has. So it's, it's an artifact of photography. It's not a trick. It's just an artifact to the photographic process. You could argue that a frozen 
drop of water falling in a waterfall, like frozen at a very high shutter speed, is equally artificial because your eye can't see that either. So I like to I like to play tricks on people uh, visually. It's a 100% real subject. It's a 100% single exposure, but the results are slightly abstract. So it's um, one of the fun things about photography. Sean, again, um, I struggled using the panorama mode with my Leica CL. It almost never worked out for me in the multiple shots, did not merge well at all, all the exposure. Um, da -da -da -da. Do you use a tripod of the Deluxe or is it made by hand? All of my panoramas are made by hand, so I, I will shoot. So Vincent, if you're listening very quickly, all my panoramas are shot like this. So I'm gonna go quickly, but just to give you a summary. Left to right, manual focus, manual exposure, focusing on the horizon and then not refocusing and then going left to right overlapping the pictures 50 percent so you you look through the camera you look where the where the center of the picture is where the focusing point is then you move the left hand side of the frame to that point shoot again shoot again shoot again and then you must have a 50 percent overlap and if you follow the horizon with the focusing point it will be level and if the exposure doesn't vary because you are manual exposure, then Lightroom will stitch them together pretty much flawlessly. As soon as you start taking pictures which are difficult to stitch, super wide or at inch odd angles or whatever, the software has more and more difficulty. And then you may need to get more specialist software like um, PTGUI, PTGUI, which is way more geeky, uh, way more powerful, but a lot harder to use. So very, very quick summary there. <laughs> All right, moving on, seascapes. I'd also shoot with a drone quite a bit. Um, I find that seascapes and especially uh, these sorts of pictures, it's a whole new picture, which you simply cannot get from ground level. So I have a little Mavic 2 Pro, shoots 20 megapixel images and it's, I don't go, I never go without it. And in most of my books, you'll see a considerable number of drone pictures that give me at least a positional shot like you sometimes you start with an overview and then you get into the detail so there's nothing beats a drone for this sort of picture be aware of the rules um, don't fly in national parks without permission although in queensland you can the other states you can't none of them um, don't fly too high don't fly near people you know do the right thing but as long as you follow the rules and regulations and don't annoy people it's the most fantastic photographer's tool possible i'm really highly recommended you get this sort of picture too. So this is the same place. This is Alexandra Bay near Noosa in Queensland. This is Alexandra Beach here. This is Noosa National Park. And then this is a uh, same place, different day, uh, looking down onto a couple of surfers uh, just as a wave comes through. And with the sun out, this is when sun is good. When you've got clear blue water, the sun makes it look fantastic. On a cloudy day, this picture won't work. But looking straight down on those two people, or almost straight down, I'm not over. I'm not over them. You're not allowed to fly directly over people, but you can give the impression of that just by shooting at an oblique angle slightly, and it looks like you're over them, and you get this wonderful effect. And the two pictures together work really well as a set. Thought that might. Uh, I think I thought that might get some questions. <laughs> um, John Henderson, first of all, can you discuss the effects of spot field matrix focus on exposure in your photos? Um, they can have spot metering or oh, focusing, sorry, focusing, not metering. Um, I almost always use field focus. Now we're talking about like a SL2 and Q2 and CL here. Um, they have those options, which is either a very small focusing point or a slightly larger one or matrix focusing, which picks the focusing po point for you. I will never use that third one. You pick the focus point all the time. Never let the camera do it for you. But I use field. It seems to be a nice compromise of the two. Um, yeah, so I, I and in actual fact, beyond that, I actually use manual focus a lot too. Because when you're on the tripod and you put the camera, the SL and the CL onto manual focus, as soon as you move the focusing ring, it magnifies the view in the viewfinder, and that's critical focus. No matter what focus mode you're in, you can see the picture is sharp, and that's my preferred method for landscape pictures when the subject's not moving, okay? Uh, Bev, hi, Bev. Uh, when are you doing a drone workshop? <laughs> um, 
pass. I, I very much doubt I'll be doing a drone workshop. Um, there are other people who do them, I'm sure, but uh, I, I don't think we'll be doing one. Mark, again, um, Lightroom will be indispensable in processing these images. When can we expect your Lightroom video course? Ta-da! Before the end of 2020, absolutely. Um, I'm right at the end of it now. Um, just doing the printing one and the uh, storage one. And we are hoping, don't quote me on this, we're hoping to have it out at the beginning of December. So that's only in a couple of weeks time. So I'm feverishly working away on it and hopefully have that out soon. So you will be in the newsletter. You will be informed about it, of course. Vincent Ip, do you have to have a CASA license for flying drones? No, but if you want to get permission to photograph somewhere that you need permission to get to photograph, you will need a license. But if you're flying and shooting for recreational purposes in a place where anybody can fly a drone anyway, no, you don't need a pilot's license. Okay, moving on. Um, this is another one of my long exposures. It's a seascape, this is the Gold Coast. Um, I do like that flat water and I like the way the clouds move. It gives a sense of passing time and it's just a different look. Um, I, Maybe I'm going through a long exposure phase, I don't know. Um, I know when I used the uh, Noctilux, I shot everything at 0.95 and went through a no depth of field phase. And that's fine. Everybody has their little themes, I suppose. But right now, I'm very much enjoying this particular style of, of image. This is um, from the workshop I did in Tasmania. And I'm just, I think this is the last couple of the landscape, the um, coastal ones. It's all about the light. And in so many cases, it's all about getting up really early. Um, this was um, like a four o'clock get up, get out into the car, walk for 10, 15 minutes in the dark with the head torches, get set up. Now, I tend to cheat a little bit because my guests won't have been there before, but I have. So I know exactly what the view is going to be. It's a little bit of showmanship involved because I know that if we get a good dawn, that whole view is going to be revealed in all its majesty as like a nice little surprise. I keep my fingers crossed. But then you see you get lights like this and um, that makes everything worthwhile. Sometimes it's really fleeting. And this is something else I'll just make a little point about is make sure that you know how to use your camera properly. Not about what you point it at, but what buttons do what so that you could get to a place like this, put your tripod down, put the camera on it, set F8, get the right exposure and shoot. Almost as quickly as I've just said that. That's important and you can practice that at home. If you're faffing around, fiddling around with the gear trying to work out what to do, you, the light's gone. It might only last 30 seconds. So practice, practice at home, get that mastered. Otherwise you will find that it, you, you pay the price when things are happening really well. Oh, this is one near Melbourne. This is um, anyone, anyone guess, anyone know where that is? Gonna, someone's gonna put that in the, the chat for me. Should be able to get that one. That's, um, no, okay, uh, that's Cape Shank down on Mornington, which is a good spot. You can scramble down to these rocks and there's this lovely rock spire sticking out. And this is this particular picture I put in because I wanted to show you how important the shutter speed is. The difference between a 15th, an eighth, a quarter and a half is quite a lot when it comes to water that's moving quickly. And there's no way of knowing which is gonna give you the best result because it depends on how close the water is and how quickly it's moving. So when you've got water sucking in and rushing out and splashing around the place, shoot at a different, at different shutter speeds and find the one that gives you just the right amount of movement that's not too blurred. And you, you'll end up with a lot of very different pictures based around the shutter speed that you use. So it's a, it's a nice little exercise to try that, get some experience in it. Um, Anonymous attendee, do you ever use a Leica M for landscapes? Absolutely. Um, not now, because I don't own one anymore. I've got, I'm shooting on the SL2, but before this was an SL and before that was a Leica M240. And I used that for two years as my principal camera or shooting landscapes, shooting a lot on the 18 mil on the M and I'm using a little visor flex on top, which makes it really comfortable to shoot on tripod. So it's actually a really good landscape camera highly recommended and it's nice and compact too. Um, I don't have uh, I don't have a mon M monochrome, but the, M, the, the M10R would be ideal, 40 megapixels, um, much more compact than the SL2. So M10R with an 18 mil and a 28 and a 50 will fit in a bag like that big. That's a fantastic little landscape kit, seriously. 
Okay, let's whiz through some Outback pictures. Um, this is a setup picture. <laughs> I did a workshop, a Life Academy workshop, um, and a couple of other ones previously where we went to the Kimberley and we uh, stayed on a place at a place called Mount um, Home Valley, which is run by the same people who operate Mosman Gorge, actually, uh, uh, Voyages. And they have, um, they were able to stage a bit of a, a bit of yard work for us. So there's about a hundred head of cattle and three or four of the stockmen running around kicking up as much dust as possible as the sun goes down behind them. And that's the key. I shoot a lot of pictures like this into the sun because then you get these wonderful silhouettes and you get all those shapes, but straight into the sun. You can let the camera meter do the work for you on multi-matrix metering. Uh, it's amazing how, how well the camera will deal with this sort of light. And this is where the Leica glass scores. It's where, you, where the, you know, the rubber hits the road with the glass. Leica lenses handle this light astonishingly well when it's coming straight in the lens. You get what flare there is, is very controllable and you still maintain the contrast, which is absolutely critical. This was shot on an M, Leica M240 with the 35 mil Summicron, I think. This is on the 50 mil Summicron. Um, same situation. Basically, they just milled around for as the sun went down. And I was there with the workshop and we all just shot a lot of pictures. And as things happen, it, you get different shapes. You get the, 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 cow, the cowboy will be in one place and the cow somewhere else. And then they're all crisscrossing. It was all about timing and focusing. It was a great exercise. A lot of fun. Um, Ralph Domino, Nick, can you explain how you shoot into the light and maintain Oops, maintain detail. Use a Leica lens. <laughs> um, it's high dynamic range sensor helps immensely, but really it's about the lens because uh, if I had the raw file of this and I opened up the shadows a lot, it would go a bit weird. It wouldn't look pleasing, but there would be detail and contrast in those shadows. Guarantee it. And that's what you get from the highest possible quality gear. I mean, most people will say it's not about the camera, it's about the person behind the camera. Well, that's true. But sometimes the technical ability of a camera to deal with difficult light will only be apparent at the high end of the gear range. So M lenses, SL lenses, they, they eat this stuff for breakfast. Um, it's, it actually is quite easy to do. You know, I'm just basically trusting the camera here for exposure and I'm concentrating on focusing and framing. Um, okay, next one. Same principle. This is a rodeo up in WA uh, near um, Mullawa. That's it, Mullawa Rodeo, straight into the light. This is on the CL using the 55 to 135 lens. And if you saw the exhibition at the Melbourne store, this lens was on the wall about this big. And that's a well, it's, I won't call it a cheap camera and lens, but it's one of the better priced products in the Leica range, very comparable to, to mid-range DSLRs. That's a um, APS-C sensor. And again, you've got all of this detail in the on the shadow side. That contrast is astonishing. It's a very, very satisfying combination of camera and lens will deal with so many things. And with the 135 focal length, that's the equivalent of a 200 mil, uh, roughly, on the SL. It gives me a little bit of reach in places where you can't get too close, obviously, like this. Same, same place, backlit. There were other people there taking pictures. They were on the sunny side. Go on the shade side. You will always get better images in these circumstances when you're photographing things. This is more what I've been photographing over the last few years than the landscapes. I called it Destination Australia, this talk, talk because it's about all things Australian as well. So I thought, I thought I would throw in a few people pictures as well. Uh, Mark, do you use a UV or protective filter for your Leica lenses? And do you keep the lens hood on? Lens hood on, yes. Filters, not so much. Um, it's, a, it's a one with, a, with no definitive answer. Um, if you want to put a protective filter on the front, you, it's, it's a good idea for sure. Keep the dust off and then you can scrub at it, clean it. And then if you scratch it, you can buy a new filter rather than a new lens. Um, I tend not to, but not 
because of any particular reason. Maybe I should. I've damaged lenses in the past. I do know that if you shoot night shots, like that Gold Coast picture I showed you before, you can get double reflections sometimes. So you just take the filter off. So yeah, it's probably not a bad idea, but I, I don't have a definitive answer for you on that one, I'm afraid. Um, any more questions? Okay. And now here is a, I put this picture in, not because it's one of my most favorite photographs, but because there's an effect here, a look, which I doubt anybody's going to identify. Um, if you can see what I'm talking about, can you see how it's a wide angle shot, but it's got vir virtually no depth of field. These trees and these people here are really out of focus. And it wasn't shot on a Noctilux because that would only really give me the horse. That's a, it's actually the equivalent of about a 20, one millimeter lens. I'm just going to answer this question and then I'll come back and tell you what's going on. Um, oh no, this, that's why right. it's been referred across to my Q and A. Uh, Vincent, yes, Vincent here, absolutely stitching. This is shot on a tele on a fit on a 35 mil 1.4, but on the CL. So that's the equivalent of a 50 mil 1.4. But I've taken eight pictures. So you can think of this picture as two, two rows of four. So what I've done is I've got the depth of field of a 50 millimeter lens, but I've got the angle of view of like a 21 millimeter lens because I've taken four pictures across. It's a little bit tricky. It's a little bit experimental. It's not easy to pull it off, but when you do get it, it's got a kind of large format, old fashioned look about it um, and it can be tricky to stitch the pictures together too. I'm just sort of throwing this in here as a bit of a inspiration without necessarily telling you exactly how to do it, but I'm sure you get the idea. Um, it basically is a telephoto or standard lens or slightly longer shot at widest aperture, but using multiple shots from more from closer than you would normally do. So you're getting you're using multiple shots to get the scene, but you're using a single lens wide open for each of those shots. So it's like combining the perspective of a 50 millimeter or 75 millimeter lens with the angle of view of a much wider angle lens. So you're having the best of both, but it is a little bit of work to do. Not all subjects lend themselves to it. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Well done, Vincent, for picking me up on that one. Um, Pauline, can you repeat the landscape gear again, please? Uh, if you're referring to the uh, M, gear I mentioned. Um, I was suggesting an 18. Actually, no, they don't make them anymore. They just discontinued them last month. 21 millimeter, 28 millimeter, 50 millimeter, something like that. And this would apply to all cameras. So something really wide, 16, 18, 21, something like that. Something modestly wide, 28. That's like a phone shot, that's 28 mil. And then something um, that allows you to pick details out, like a 50 millimeter, and then maybe a longer lens. But for landscapes, that's less important. Those three lenses will do pretty much everything you need for landscape stuff. Um, or a 24 to 90 zoom. You know, I, I could do 95% of what I need to do on this lens. It's astonishingly versatile. It's a bit of a beast. But when you compare it to carrying multiple lens around, it's not so bad. Um, doesn't quite have the style of the little M lenses. It's not quite so beautiful, but it's a very, very functional tool. So, you know, you have to sort of make your own mind out what, what suits you really. Bob Hall, hi Nick, um, hi Bob. Um, how do you get the subject to stay put whilst you shoot it? Hope for the best. I, I shot this picture very quickly. And again, this comes down to mastering your, your, your gear. You don't want to refocus. So what the way this was done was I focused on the girl in the saddle and I held the shutter button halfway. That locks the exposure. And then I've gone quickly and basically guessing a quick one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight without letting go of the shutter button. Because if I do that, it'll refocus. So it's like a twitch of the finger to hold the focus and the exposure. You don't want to lift your finger up because it'll refocus and change the exposure um, or do the whole thing in manual. Same thing, focus and manual, exposure in manual, and then shoot the pictures or as many as you like. Shoot more than you need. It doesn't matter. The software will deal with it. 
but make sure you've got plenty of coverage and do it as quickly as you can. Or ask the person to stay still. Um, so I know Christian Fletcher did this with a, a portrait of his daughter when he was trying this technique out. That was, it was he was the one who introduced me to it. Um, and he got this astonishing portrait. It's a full length shot of his daughter, but it had that telephoto look, but it was clearly a wide angle field of view. It's uh, yeah, it's tricky stuff. All right. Then of course, in the outback, you've got little details. This is um, Thorny Devil. Um, Moloch horridus, I think is the Latin name. These things you just fall over sometimes in the right place at the right time. But if you do ever see one, do get down and get dirty and get your macro lens out because they're only about so big, beautiful little things. But um, keep your eye open for the small details because it's not all about sand dunes and wide open spaces when you're in the outback. I did talk, uh, I, in the description of this talk, I did say talking about my favorite places, and obviously I've mentioned a few. Another one of my favorite places is Karajini National Park up in the north of WA, the central north of WA, um, halfway between Perth and the Kimberley, I suppose. Um, that is a fabulous place to go if you get a chance. And you, there's these slot canyons that you can get down into, and you can have a lovely time with your tripod looking for interesting graphic shapes and water trickling. Um, this is Hancock Gorge, I think, and this is what they call the natural jacuzzi in Hammersley Gorge. This is shot on a fisheye to give it that weird, it is round, but it, I wanted to give it quite a different look. Um, that's uh, Hammersley Gorge, and then this one is Wino Gorge. This is called Hanrail Pool, and the reason I put this one in is because it just shows the having a picture, having a person for scale really makes a difference. This is a panoramic stitch as well. So it's a, that's a 180 degree angle on a wide angle lens going left to right, stitching, as I've said before, manual focus, manual exposure. And that person is actually my journalist colleague because I was doing a story for Australian Geographic. And I just said, stay there for just a few seconds whilst I shoot this picture, because I knew that the person was gonna give me the scale I wanted. Aerial stuff, not a drone this time. This is the Simpson Desert uh, out near in the east of Lake Eyre. Uh, was on a um, station, Kalamurina station, which is owned by Bush Heritage. Or, oh, sorry, um, Australian Wildlife Conservancy. Sorry, wrong, wrong group. And they happened to have a helicopter there doing some work. And I was able to ask them if I could just do a little quick 10 minute up shoot and down at dawn because I wanted to get these really abstract shapes of the sand dunes. So sand dunes are great on the ground, but they're also great from the air. So on the ground, they look more like this sort of thing. And this is taken from maybe six inches above the, the dunes, very, very close, very, very wide angle lens. And I found some little critter paw prints. That would be some sort of hopping mouse possibly. It's hard to tell, um, which gives you that diagonal line and breaks up the, the ripples of the sand dunes. There's not many places in Australia where you find these bare dunes that are red. There's lots of bare dunes that are white and yellow, but genuinely red, they're not so common. This is near Windora in Western Queensland. And just to the west of town, there's some really good exposed dunes that are quite extensive. The other good place for dunes um, is a place called Craven's Peak, but that's private property and um, that has got great dunes. Also, I'm looking for little details um, of little tiny things growing. There's a metaphor there, obviously, for struggle and tenacity and all that. This was shot, interestingly enough, on the Leica Q with a 28 millimeter lens wide open. And you can see how that depth of field drifts off beautifully. That's with a 28 millimeter lens using the Q's macro mode. So that little bit of, little bit of vegetation is maybe only an inch high. So that Q is a really nice little, uh, little tool. And I think that's the last picture. This is the dunes at Craven's Peak, but you'll find them near Windora as well and a few other places. And this is a sort of archetypal evening shot with the dunes. And the reason, well, I put this in because it's, you know, it's, it's a nice dune picture, but clouds, clouds make these pictures. Blue sky in this picture, fine, it's nice dune. But as soon as you've got that textured sky with light clouds over it, totally transforms the image. So uh, late afternoon sun with some, basic clouds there that's really one of the key things to look for so i think 
oh, this is the last picture because I was going to sh share with you my, my only double exposure. I very, very rarely do these pictures, but sometimes there's only one way to get a shot. This is the Parachilna Hotel in the Flinders Ranges. And I wanted to, we were camping nearby and I had the idea to get the stars over the hotel. The problem is the, the lights under the veranda of the hotel are way brighter than the stars. So there's no way you can do this as a single exposure. So what I've done here is I've done an exposure for the building and then I've waited, left the camera until the public can turn the lights out at whatever time they closed. So the whole place has gone dark. And then I've done another exposure, which would have been something like uh, 3200 ISO, um, 30 seconds wide open at about f2.8. That'll give you a reasonable star field picture. And then because there were two separate pictures, I've actually masked them together in Photoshop. So it's something I do probably once every couple of years when I need to. Um, because it's still the, the same subject in the same location. It's just that it's impossible to capture that in a single exposure, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I just don't think you can do it. So um, there you go, double exposure and then a, a, a Photoshop job to finish with. All right, that is the last of the slides. I've got a few questions to answer which we'll go through and then we'll call it an evening i hope there's been some inspiration there for you um here we go ken wang any tips on using the like accused panoramic mode um to be honest no <laughs> i only shoot panoramas in one way and that's in full manual um i know some cameras have a a, a way of like a, a panoramic assisting mode and i have very little experience with that because i've practiced enough with my handheld panoramas the way I do it and I, I tend to fall back on that so um, I can't help you if there is if I don't even know if the queue has a panoramic mode like that um, I know it has some scene modes but to be honest I've never used one um, that, that I, it's something I just turn off and leave turned off on any camera I've ever owned so I prefer to do it the way I know that's not to say it won't get you good results you know I'm not saying it's something you shouldn't use if it works it works it's just not something, it's not something I have any experience with, I'm afraid. Um, Ralph is wondering whether the dunes were focus stacked. No, they are all, all those pictures are single shots, um, probably at F11, but probably on an 18 millimeter lens. So you're gonna get plenty of depth of field with a lens like that. Um, I don't do focus stacking very much, um, except when I absolutely have to, because it's more work, <laughs> I'd rather not have to, but, my 18 mil on my SL2 or, or an M seems to give me plenty of depth of field at about F11 um, from like one meter onwards. And that, that seems to work well enough for me. Okay, Vincent Ip, um, how heavy a tripod do you recommend for these landscapes and the last one, the stars? Well, as heavy as you're prepared to carry. Um, I often take two tripods with me in the car because the heavy one, is for short range photographs and the light one for longer range ones. So if I've got the car handy, who cares how heavy the tripod is? But if I've got to then move to somewhere, I'll usually take the Series 2 Gitso with me. Um, I do take the, the big one with me, this one. I used this all last weekend, but I was only walking a couple of kilometers maximum and it's nowhere near as heavy as it looks anyways, about three kilos. Uh, you kind of get used to it as well. Um, Strongly recommended, and it was also windy uh, where I was shooting. So you cannot get away with a flimsy tripod and strong wind. Even a, a big tripod um, like this will have difficulty. That's why I was saying before, get down low and don't extend the legs. That will give you the best possible chance of getting a stable picture. All right, I'm going to call it quits there. Um, Selwyn says, thank you. Thanks, Selwyn. Um, David says, thank you. A few people saying, thank you. That's great. Um, if there's no more questions, I'm going to call that an evening. Now the, the shackles seem to be coming off as all around the country, fingers crossed. Let's um, get out and take some pictures. The holidays are coming up. Uh, maybe some of those ideas and techniques there will be of use to you. So uh, thank you very much for watching. I'm just going to put back that first slide on the screen and I'm going to uh, disappear myself. Sorry. Oh, another question. Oh, a couple more questions. Sorry. <laughs>
Better finish these ones off. Sorry, sorry. Valerie, uh, I'll just say thank, thank you for the presentation. That's great. So they will be on YouTube, remember, um, this particular presentation. Just hang on a sec, what? YouTube channel. Yeah, I'm just saying, yeah. So I'm just getting advice in my ear. If I, I'm just sort of, <laughs> um, don't forget to look on the YouTube channel for this one, but also there's a whole bunch of them. So there are some, there are some tips and tricks ones as well. If you look further back down the line, um, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but yeah, have a look through them. There's 20 or 30 or maybe even 40. Um, there's even some little videos I did ages ago about the story behind the picture where I've taken a single image and I've explained how I shot it. So it, it, it's an ever increasing resource for pictures and that Lightroom video promise I'll have it a um, series of videos, a video course. I promise I'll have that out just as soon as I can finish it off and get it to a, uh, to a position I'm in that I'm happy with. All right, guys, good night for me. I will see you all very soon. If I don't see anybody in the meantime, before next year, have a great Christmas. We will be starting our free webinars in uh, probably February, having a bit of a break over the, uh, the Christmas holidays. And then we'll have a whole new program of things for you as well. So watch this space, as they say. All right, goodbye from me.